Greetings, everyone. Thanks for joining us at the Progressive Forum. We're the world's only expressly progressive lecture series, and we're based in Houston, Texas. I'm Randall Morton, founder of the Forum. We're excited to present CNN presidential historian Douglas Brinkley discussing his landmark book, Silent Spring Revolution, John F. Kennedy, Rachel Carson, Lyndon Johnson, Richard Nixon, and the Great Environmental Awakening. This is a highly charged story of an indomitable generation that quite literally saved the natural world after President Kennedy was jolted by Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. This is an inspiring book we need today. I'm grateful to our generous sponsors who made our in-person event and this free live stream possible. Mike Bloker and Lisa Paris, thank you so much. This live stream is a recorded version of our recent in-person event in Houston. You can view the recording on our website indefinitely. To purchase this important book at a discount, click the link under the screen and our terrific partners at Blue Willow Bookshop will send you a copy. And I hope you'll consider a donation to the Progressive Forum, which is voluntary, starting as low as $5 on up to several thousand to keep these free live streams going. Just click the link. Douglas Brinkley is a best-selling author of some 40 books. He's a chair in humanities and professor of history at Rice University. Brinkley has advised the American Museum of Natural History, the Yellowstone Park Foundation, and the National Audubon Society. I give you Douglas Brinkley. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Good evening, and thank you all for being here. I'm on the cusp of taking off for a whirlwind book tour, which I'm now kind of looking forward to because of COVID. When I was locked down, I kept imagining I might be able to get out there and travel the country again. And the book, as you just heard from Randall, Silent Spring Revolution, it'll be out this um, Tuesday. And I am, um, you are my first talk I'm giving anywhere in the U.S. I'm doing CBS Sunday Morning um, with Jane Pauley on Sunday, and then I'm in New York and doing all the uh, shows starting with Morning Joe on MSNBC. Um, and so I'm just honored to get to kick this off here. And of course, I'm a professor, as Randall mentioned, at Rice, so this is my own backyard right here. Um, the reason I wanted this, not just to make you look like it's a, a uh, doorstop, um, but I've been really took on as my life work a three-volume presidential history of the uh, topic of the environmental movement. And my first one, The Wilderness Warrior, dealt with Theodore Roosevelt. And just so you know, the word progressive for the progressive form is really applicable here because there, it really was the progressive movement of Theodore Roosevelt's era. He was president in 1901 to 1909. And TR said that conservation was the number one issue in the United States, the managing of our natural resources, number one. He created the US Forest Service of today. If you pull a map and look at the West and see all these national forests or go to Davy Crockett National Forest, that didn't exist until TR created our, our Forest Service. He created 51 federal bird reservations, which is the beginning of U.S. fish and wildlife. Today, you all own 550 national wildlife refuges throughout the country. He started using executive power to save treasured landscapes. Theodore Roosevelt would say the French might have the Louvre, that um, you know, Britain might have Westminster Abbey, India might have Taj Mahal, but we have the Tetons, we have Yellowstone, we have Yosemite. And he went so far as stood on the rim of the Grand Canyon with former Rough Riders, men that he served with in the Spanish-American War, and Roosevelt said, do not touch it, God has made it, you will only mar it, leave the Grand Canyon alone. And the Senate moved to 
uh, have it mined for zinc, asbestos, and copper. And Roosevelt used an executive order declaring the entire Grand Canyon a, a federal preserve, and it, he immediately got sued, and it went through the courts. But lo and behold, we have today the Grand Canyon. Figures of that era like John Muir, founder of the Sierra Club, people like Gifford Pinchot, the great scientific forester, that was the first progressive environmental movement, TR, Theodore Roosevelt. Second, I wrote about in a book called Rightful Heritage, Franklin D. Roosevelt in the Land of America. And that is, and I don't know if you realize, but Franklin Roosevelt, his entire life, when he filled out an occupation of job, he would write tree farmer. He was born on the Hudson River, grew up on the Hudson River, lived his entire life on the Hudson River. Eleanor Roosevelt said, there's no knowing my husband if you don't know the river. It was, it, the Hudson was FDR's lifeblood. And from that experience, he adds to what TR did, meaning, do you know FDR created 800 state parks? And of course, here in Texas, FDR did Big Bend, you know, and, and um, you know, he fought to save the Everglades, Great Smoky Mountains, on and on. But he also paid a dollar a day um, unemployed people to work for the Civilian Conservation Corps and the, during FDR's New Deal, they planted nearly three billion trees. And an America that had been, been destroyed by um, agriculture runoff, waste products, um, a dust bowl, our whole country, we talk about the Great Depression's not just the stock market crashed, our whole country have been abused, and FDR's New Deal created a second environmental movement, if you'd like. My new book's The Third Wave, and it's from 1960 to 1973. 1960, the year John F. Kennedy ran for president and won, and the year Wallace Stegner, a Pulitzer Prize-winning novelist, wrote his wilderness letter, the year that a famous photographer, Ansel Adams, did a book, This is the American Earth, with Nancy Newall. And it ends in 1973 when Richard Nixon, on December 28th, brings the Endangered Species Act into existence. And a bipartisan vote in the U.S. Senate, 92 to nothing. Um, so what is this third wave, and how does it come about? And we're not at the fourth wave. I know we all want to believe with climate we are. We've come near when Gore was, was did Inconvenient Truth, where you know people like Bill McKibben, who has been part of this lecture series, has been pushing for it. We're always right there and don't really pull it, pull it off. Um, I had to begin my book uh, in 1945, Hiroshima Nagasaki game-changing event, world history, birth of the atomic age. During World War II, anything we could do to win the war counted. And in the United States, we started mass producing all sorts of chemicals, all sorts of war materials. And of course, the nuclear bomb out of the Manhattan Project, the first bomb blowing up that we exploded in the Trinity test in New Mexico. But after Hiroshima, when the bomb dropped, only days later, a writer named Norman Cousins wrote a, a, a very popular little missive in which she said, is man obsolete? Does this atomic bomb mean the destruction of our planet? And there was fear. You know, people that were against the bomb, um, in my book I write about some, were, 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 meaning that did not like that we used it in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. There weren't many. Jo um, but one of them that was against it was Joe Kennedy, John F. Kennedy's father. Another was Albert Schweitzer, who would win a Nobel Prize for his work dealing with sick people in Africa. And another was Norman Cousins, who ran the Saturday Literary Review which used to be a big deal. And out of this, 
it wasn't a movement really to stop or, or to worry that America didn't have nuclear weapons. We were the only nuclear monopoly. Only one time in world history does one country a nuclear monopoly. United States, 1945 to 49. We're the only one that had it, and it was a lot of pride in the United States that we did. But suddenly, scientific reports started coming in, one after the other. And this was the problem of, um, of radiation and of, and of chemicals and fallout, nuclear dust, how you're going to get a spike in cancer, leukemia, and the, right, and the rest. And that data came in, and the leading voice worried about it at first was Barry Commoner, who in 1980 ran for president for the Citizens Party, and he's largely forgotten now. But Commoner was a, a genius at science, PhD at, um, at Harvard. And during World War II, Barry Commoner was the one who would put chemicals on planes and, that would, and, and they would dust crop DDT to help our soldiers to make sure they didn't get malaria, meaning a chemical agent. And we'd pour, dump it and dump it and dump it. And Commoner's research in the 1950s, early 50s, is showing not only is nuclear fallout, we, the radiation sickness um, horrific, but the use of insecticides and pesticides like DDT T were too. Now, if we were just using our atomic bomb in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, it wouldn't have wedged into a new environmental consciousness. But alas, we started blowing up nuclear bombs willy-nilly in Nevada, one after the other, bomb after bomb after bomb. And the people that got sick from it weren't just in Nevada and Utah. It blew all across the land. We started seeing high levels of radiation and, um, um, and um, strontium-90 in people as far as New York. Writers like Kurt Vonnegut wrote about it early in his career. Commoner starts preaching about it as a pub public scientist with scientific information. And another person skeptical of nuclear testing like we're doing in Nevada, was Rachel Carson. Rachel Carson was born in Springdale, Pennsylvania. She went to today what is called Chatham in Pennsylvania. It was women's college. She, at an early age, never saw the ocean, but she dreamed of it. She won a lot of essay, won prizes for writing, um, you know, stories about the natural world and magazines like St. Nicholas for young people. Um, she eventually makes her way to Johns Hopkins to do a master's in zoology. But her big moment, the Rachel Carson's first big epiphany in life, she got a fellowship to go to Woods Hole. Woods Hole is in Cape Cod, walking distance from the Kennedy compound. Woods Hole was the oceanographic um, vortex in, of studies in America. Yes, there are studies being done in Miami, but uh, beyond that, and some in California, there is nothing like Woods Hole. Maybe there isn't today. Today, in Texas now, we have, you know, University of Texas is at Port Aransas, or, you know, Texas A&M is in Corpus Christi, and we're doing marine studies. Carson went there, got really interested in things like eels, the migratory journey of eels across the ocean into rivers. And she started writing books and articles, but, and, and she worked for U.S. Fish and Wildlife. She worked for FDR. During World War II, Rachel Carson's war effort was doing radio broadcasts for the government about the oceans, and particularly about our fish stocks, what's going on with the shad, you know, what's going on with our crab populations. Many of her articles would appear in the Baltimore Sun, and in 1946, she started a booklet series, you know, about FDR with the WPA guides in World War II, about all regions. She started doing and organizing WPA-like guides. They were called Conservation in Action for the government on all these wildlife refuges that we had around the country. And she then writes her first book, 
and, and, um, and, and, and to cut to the chase, by the late 40s to the, through the 50s, she wrote three books about our oceans that were mega bestsellers. Not kind of, not like on the list a couple of weeks, it disappears week after week. Everybody believed that, that nobody had ever written about oceans with the poetic beauty, scientific exactness of Rachel Carson. Um, she was a phenom. Any of you that have any interest in ocean life would have encountered her. The only competition was Anne Lindbergh um, Morrow down in Sanibel Island, Florida, who wrote a best-selling book, but that was like, um, you know, a, a lower uh, quality product. Rachel Carson was nailing these incredible um, uh, ocean books. And you know who was a big, big fan of hers? Rose Kennedy, John F. Kennedy's mother. John F. Kennedy's mom was raised in Concord, Massachusetts with Walden Pond as her backyard. And you all know Walden Pond is Henry, is Henry David Thoreau's um, famous place. In fact, I ask students sometimes and people, what's your Walden Pond? What's your Walden Pond? Meaning what place in the spiritual, natural world most speaks to you? It might be your grandmother's house, backyard. It might be a state park. It might be a river. But I ask you as an audience, what's your Walden? Well, Rose Kennedy's Walden was Walden. And when she moved and got married and in Boston and then went to, um, she ended up you know, famously in Hyannisport, all of the Kennedy kids with Rose learned to swim, not in the ocean, but in Walden Pond. Rose Kennedy was such a Thoreauvian that she made a special secret mission working with CIA to check all over Russia to see if Thoreau's books were being carried in libraries. Thoreau didn't just write Walden. He wrote another book that gets forgotten that I love called Cape Cod. And Thoreau also wrote The Maine Woods. And Thoreau also wrote an essay called Walking, which Rose Kennedy had memorized practically. And Ted Kennedy had parts of it memorized late in his life, he had still had recall of it. And the big line in Henry David Thoreau's walking essay was, in wildness is the preservation of the world. In wildness is the preservation of the world. And Thoreau said, every community needs what we might call today green belts, township parks, We've got to stay connected to the natural world and not be so arrogant that we're going to conquer nature, but we're going to live in harmony with it. And by the time in the 1950s when Rachel Carson's books were that big and Rose Kennedy found them, there was no bigger Thoreauvian than Rachel Carson. She died in Silver Spring, Maryland in 1964 with Walden at her bedside. She'd had Thoreau posted on her desk. Thoreau in the, 19, um, in the 1950s became the inspiration for a wilderness movement in the United States. And the wilderness movement came to maturity in Dinosaur National Monument in Colorado, Utah. When they were, the Bureau of Reclamation, which is part of Interior Department, was gonna build a dam but the dam would have ruined part of Dinosaur National Monument. And the protest to it was you're not, it'll, they're in the National Park bylaws, you're not allowed to destroy or mar a national park, which monuments are part of that system, a unit. And a King Daddy fight occurred in the mid 1950s. Bernard DeVoto, the lead, he died of a heart attack, but was a uh, writing for Harper's Magazine. David Brower, who was running the Sierra Club. Um, Howard Zonizer, who was running the Wilderness Society. They got aggressive in the mid-50s to stop the dam. And they won. And that victory inspired a, that whole wilderness movement. Now you also had an anti-nuclear movement being born. Norman Cousins, who I mentioned, creates SANE, S-A-N-E, 
stopping of nuclear testing and underwater and or um, in the atmosphere. So you have the anti-nuclear commoner cousins crowd coming. You're having the wilderness lobby of modern day Thorovians coming to the fruition. And you have Rachel Carson doing wildlife refuges, but with the interest of oceans and they all morph together. John F. Kennedy, who was a playboy senator, not a workhorse, due to William O. Douglas, Supreme Court Justice, Kennedy family friend got Jack involved with national seashore protection. And John F. Kennedy makes a huge mark for himself in the Senate in the late 50s promoting Cape Cod National Seashore. What's important about saving Cape Cod, which Kennedy accomplishes first year in president in 1961, is that it's not a national park like Yellowstone. Cape Cod is a national park where the communities of Wellfleet and Turo, Provincetown are interacting with the park. And that becomes another big motion. How do we create saving park zones where people can live within boundaries or around it in new and innovative ways? Carson at this point, after writing her C trilogy, started getting dumps of documents. She had worked, as I mentioned, in US Fish and Wildlife. All of these government scientists started saying, Rachel, look at what DDT is doing to the fish in our test. Look what it's doing to birds. Look what it'll do to human health. And she took all of this raw data in a whistleblower-like fashion and started crafting it into the book that is Silent Spring. In Silent Spring, she works on in the late 50s while she has breast cancer, while she's very sick, while she's going through radiation treatment, she's wearing, having to wear a wig for losing all of her, her hair, and she starts writing this manifesto. No book in American history has had the wallop or the impact of Silent Spring. The New York Times just asked me that, and I had to make a list of ones that had that kind of impact, something like Thomas Paine's Common Sense in the American Revolution, maybe Zebulon Pike's Wilderness Exploration Diaries when they were entered into the congressional record, certainly The Jungle by Upton Sinclair uh, for meatpacking industries. But Carson's book that she was working on um, finally got launched in, um, in the early 1962 with um, excerpts published in The New Yorker. What Rachel Carson had going for her beyond these movements coming together was the man I mentioned, Justice William O. Douglas. Douglas was from Yakima, Washington, could barely walk because of polio as a boy, became the hero legal brilliant mind of Columbia Law School, went on to be the Sterling Professor at Yale Law School, and Douglas goes on to being the longest serving Supreme Court Justice in US history. Keep in mind, in the period I'm talking about right now, post-war America, there is no sewage treatment plants. There is no Environmental Protection Agency. There is no Clean Air Act. There is no Clean Water Act. So these activists, that are coming together from different walks of life are starting to imagine a world that we're all living in right now, but we weren't back then. And um, Ke uh, uh, Douglas c c says that it's the Uncle Tom's cabin, Rachel Carson, what it meant to Lincoln and the abolitionists, this book's gonna mean to this new wave of conservationists or what we call environmentalists today. And the New Yorker excerpts called, and it caused an explosion because the chemical manufacturers were now had their, they were being backed up with real science. And they called her a spinster, hysterical, lesbian, any name you can think was thrown at Rachel Carson to try to smear her um, because she had, had no children, although she took care of her nephew. Um, and they were, it's it just vicious stuff. And yet, while she's being hammered and she's standing up with the New Yorker for her research, John F. Kennedy at the podium, at a question says, I'm gonna look into this pesticides due to 
um, due to um, the book by Miss Car, or the, the research found by Miss Carson. And Kennedy orders a Presidential Science Advisory Committee to look into her findings. He picked the right scientists, the best scientists. Just like in climate change today, we have climate experts. And they said Carson was right, DDT will poison people. And it wasn't just DDT. It was all of formaldehyde, misforming babies, and all of these hocus-pocus, chemical, you know, Aladdin's lamp, presto, all these con uh, things that were, weren't, weren't vetted due to the hurry-up mentality of World War II were now causing a problem. Carson's book comes out in the fall of 62, and life's never the chain, uh, is never the same in America because Carson is telling every one of you, it, it, up until Rachel Carson, conservation was what Theodore Roosevelt was doing. Let's save a national forest, or let's save a monument, Devil's Tower in Wyoming, or let's save Mammoth Cave in Kentucky. Kind of heirloom stuff. Rachel Carson is saying, your son and daughter are getting sick playing in your backyard. But the problem with DDT was it was being aerial sprayed. And the big legal case in the late 1950s was led by Marjorie Spock. And Marjorie Spock was an organic farmer on Long Island who sued all the way to the Supreme Court. And Marjorie Spock, whose brother was Dr. Benjamin Spock, the famous baby doctor. But Marjorie Spock said, I have a right to grow organic produce. How come a Suffolk County or Long Island or New York or U.S. Department of Agriculture can spray chemicals over my organic acreage? She said, that I have a right to be an organic farmer. Who owns that airspace? Lawyers in the audience will know, you know what a conundrum and issue like that is. Who's owning the airspace above? Are you know? And she lost in the Supreme Court. But William O. Douglas wrote an extraordinary dissent, uh, and, and which is also with Silent Spring, the opening bell of the environmental movement. Meanwhile, while she is hitting this sort of notoriety, Kennedy saves not just Cape Cod National Seashore, Padre Island here in Texas National Seashore, Point Reyes out in California. Um, he pushes for a wilderness act. That's the wilderness lobby I was talking about, the Thorovians. This is like Robert Frost is part of this. Secretary of Interior Stuart Udall is part of this. You guys have wilderness. Look on a map. In 1964, Lyndon Johnson saved 9.1 million acres, but we have a massive wilderness preservation system in this country. Some wilderness units bigger than West Virginia right in Montana, like the Bob Marshall up there, or the Ansel Adams in California now, wilderness is no roads. Roads are, the, the idea of wilderness is some land you gotta save where humans don't encroach. You build a road, you're gonna get, you're gonna get telephones, you're gonna get sewage lines, you're gonna get timber trucks. So you have to leave vast swaths of wilderness alone. Kennedy's pushing that hard. He doesn't get it done, but on his death, LBJ signs the Wilderness Act into law. Secretary of Interior Stuart Udall of the Kennedy Johnson years, go to the Interior Department in Washington today. It's named the Stuart Udall um, building. He was the most powerful and important Interior Secretary in U.S. history. And he writes a book modeled on Rachel Carson called The Quiet, the, um, Quiet Crisis. And so by the time JFK is killed in Dallas, this movement is underfoot. As Udall says, Kennedy let the doors crack open and all of these, what today you would call climate activists, environmentalists, preservationists, you know, um, anti-extinction people, whatever you want to call it, came pouring in the door. And LBJ is there as president, a little overwhelmed by it, but he goes with it because he has enough senators to go with it. You know, when you have 67 senators, you can get legislation done. I'm sure some of you have been to the Lyndon Johnson Presidential Library. There are just massive walls filled with signing pens of LBJ. And all of these groups like the Sierra Club or Audubon Societies all have these measures coming, LBJ signing them away. 
And you know who's cheerleading him on? Lady Bird Johnson, who's synonymous with conservation, beautification, no billboards, um, parks. And when Rachel Carson dies of her cancer, Kennedy's dead in, in, in November 63, Carson's gone in April of 64. The wave effect, Lady Bird becomes, starts becoming the voice of the national parks. She goes rafting down the Rio Grande here in Big Bend. She stands in the redwood groves and says, we're going to save them. And she becomes more popular than Lyndon on promoting this. I would say outside of Eleanor Roosevelt, if I had to rank first ladies, LB, uh, Lady Bird's very high, which she did for conservation in her era. And meanwhile, Lyndon Johnson's created things one after the other, places that maybe you haven't gotten to see, but North Cascades National Park in Washington State, Redwoods National Park in California, Canyonlands in Utah. Kennedy and Johnson create a whole new category called Lakeshore, National Lakeshores, and save places like the Indiana Dunes in Indiana outside of Chicago, Sleeping Bear Dunes in Michigan, Picture Island in Michigan, the Apostle Islands in Wisconsin, I could go on and on, saying the Great Lakes need to be preserved. They're also starting to look at environmental quality, and I don't know if any of you know the name William Ruckel's house, but he's most remembered for Watergate uh, as standing up to Nixon. But Ruckel's house was from Indiana and an incredible environmentalist who died a few years ago, first head of the EPA, and Ruckel's house told me the problem with guys like me writing books like this is we all love to do parks. And he said the big story of the 60s is sewage treatment. And nobody wants to be the sewage scholar. You know, writing about landfill scholars. They do now. It's a hot field and environmental university press books coming out. But for a long time, people didn't go, I'm going to do my PhD in Yale and study this history of sewage. Um, but our country didn't have sewage treatment. We were dumping raw everything into our waterways. In a way, I mean, we talk about the Dust Bowl of the 30s. You talk about America in the 60s. 1969, the Cuyahoga River catches fire in Ohio, cover of Time Magazine. They just happened to choose the Cuyahoga. I mean, the, Ro the, the Rouge River in Detroit had been on fire before that. That's how polluted and dirty these rivers are that they could become a wall of fire going across them. Um, and so the, uh, an LBJ tied to Vietnam War passes the first Endangered Species Act in 1966. In the back of my book, I have the list of the first animals. They were looking for chrismatic species to save. They chose the key deer, a little deer in Florida, it never quite took off. But by the second Endangered Species Act that Nixon signs, it's really about the bald eagle because the bald eagle was almost going extinct. It was vanishing like the dodo bird due to DDT, due to the thinning of eggshells and the poisoning of the fish streams. And so um, Lyndon Johnson on his way out in 68, that tumultuous year, you know, he creates things like the wild and scenic or, or national scenic trail system, saving the Appalachian Trail and the Pacific uh, Crest Trail. Um, you know, just there's one achievement after the other with LBJ and Lady Bird. Now you come in and say, look, I write in 68 about a writer, Edward Abbey's book, Desert Solitaire, or the Whole Earth Catalog and Stuart Brand and a, a, a renewed consciousness of, of indigenous people, culture, and the land. Beat generation writers, Allen Ginsberg and Gary Snyder talking about ecology. Um, but it's really kicking in. Two battles to write about in the book. I won't go in detail, but just tell you one's the Hudson River campaign to save Storm King from Con Edison, another is to stop a a power plant, nuclear power plant in Bodega Bay, California. The environmentalists win both. The motto that's developed in 1967 by the environmental movement is sue the bastards. Um, that's begun by the Environmental Defense Fund, but today it's the National Resource Defense Council, Sierra Club Defense Fund. 
meaning in a society like this, you're only, if you have those kinds of uh, lawsuits, are you going to be able to affect legislative change. I'm not saying I agree with that, but I'm telling you that was a big, big movement. Others said, we'll do it in legislature. And it was bipartisan. Now, when Nixon comes in, in 69, you'd say, well, Nixon's not an environmentalist. He wasn't. I call him at best a reluctant environmentalist. But he had a house in San Clemente. And he's only president days when the Santa Barbara oil spill hits. And where California Republicans, his donors, had big fancy homes in Laguna Beach and Newport, and they're screaming bloody murder. I've read the letters to Nixon. Do something about it. Our whole shoreline's getting destroyed by this oil spill. So he's constituent politics, puts an ear to it and deals with it. Then the Cuyahoga that summer, and Gaylord Nelson, senator for Wisconsin, is really hatching the idea of the first Earth Day. But do you know who's funding Earth Day? Who funds it? The big one, 1970 Earth Day. Walter Ruther, head of the labor leader of the United Auto Workers. Ruther was the biggest environmental voice of the 60s and 70s, a labor union leader, writing checks to Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta in California fighting environmental justice issues, particularly pesticides, like Rachel Carson warned, warned about, hurting uh, farm workers. And Martin Luther King dies, gets shot in Memphis in a garbage sanitation strike. These are the birth of what we call today environmental justice, or Chavez and King, urban centers, because wherever people of color lived, that became a dumping zone. Uh, the poor, the, the real estate, the poor, the neighborhood, we were bear, burying our toxic sludge and debris, and kids were getting sick, and people were dying in Houston, people were dying in Fort Myers, Florida, people were dying in San Antonio from these sort of contaminants. And Nixon's smart enough. Nixon says this. First off, his big advisor is John Ehrlichman, domestic Watergate. Do you realize Ehrlichman was a water and land environmental lawyer in Seattle before he entered the Nixon domestic advisor? He was the NIMBY guy you would hire if you were rich in Puget Sound and didn't like a, he stopped an aluminum factory from being built near wealthy people. Nixon went and visited him in the early 1960s and was amazed that he could make a business out of environmental law. Not only that, Nixon didn't know any, didn't care for environmentalists, so when he needed one, when he ran for president, said, John, will you be my environmentalist? And he did well, Ehrlichman, with the press, and suddenly Nixon put him as domestic advisor in the White House and told Ehrlichman, I want nothing to do with the environment. You deal with all that crap. Ehrlichman, by people like the Sierra Club and others, is called a covert green, believe it or not. Um, because he was getting this legislation. Who was he getting legislation from for Nixon? Henry M. Jackson, Scoop Jackson of Washington. Washington State was pro, Jackson was pro-Vietnam War and even stood by Nixon through Cambodia and Laos. And Nixon loathed liberals, loathed progressives, meaning he disdained George McGovern and Eugene McCarthy and Ted Kennedy and Gaylord Nelson and Frank Church and Ed Muskie. He despised Ed Muskie, Nixon. So Jackson was like John Conley of Texas, who Nixon liked, a Democrat he liked, because Scoop's not taking to the microphone and denouncing my administration. And so Scoop hires the best, smartest environmental lawyer types you could imagine and starts cobbling out these laws. And on New Year's Day, January 1, 1970, Nixon at San Clemente signs the Jackson and Dingle of Michigan, Congressman John Dingle, and creates NEPA, National Environmental Policy Act. That's the game changer. NEPA is what makes any business, corporation, real estate person have to have an environmental impact statement. It has had a very uh, a dramatic change in behavior in the United States. And then not only following that, Nixon after NEPA 
seeing Earth Days coming, April 22nd, 1970, gives the most progressive environmental speech of any president, Richard Nixon's State of the Union Address, 1970. It'll blow your mind if you read it. You, Bill McKibben couldn't have written it. Uh, um, it's that green. And that Earth Day, the whole world turned into the environmental movement. And you have songs like, you know, um, you know, people like Joan Baez and Pete Seeger, but also Marvin Gaye, you know, Mercy Me, The Ecology. Um, you, you had a wave of popular culture talking about ecology, environment. Schools have to teach ecology and environment. It was a movement. It was Rachel Carson's revolution. And it's Nixon and Ehrlichman and Ruckelshaus who banned DDT at last, 10 years after Rachel Carson wrote the book. Uh, in Silent Spring Revolution. It gets banned in North America um, and for usage. Um, and not only that, Nixon, always thinking about getting reelected in 1972, says, I'm gonna out musky musky on the environment. And he creates the Environmental Protection Agency. It opens its doors in December 1970. EPA is law enforcement. Its job is to bust polluters, people breaking the law. And not only EPA, Nixon creates NOAA. When you hear about NOAA today or doing research on our atmosphere and all, Nixon creates NOAA in 1970. Nixon signs the most progressive Clean Air Act of 1970. That's still, I don't know where we'd be as a country with emission standards. Nixon starts pushing to get lead out of gasoline and is successful. And when I say Nixon, it means it's become bipartisan, guys something you're not seeing with climate change right now. It's a bipartisan movement that's, that took a hold of the United States. It culminates really in 1972 with the Clean Water Act, and you have Republicans like Howard Baker of Tennessee and others as real environmentalists. In Nixon's last act, Endangered Species Act of 73, I saw the beautiful Andy Warhol um, gallery here uh, which is just remarkable of, of um, you know, everybody from Groucho Marx to um, Kafka here at the temple. And the uh, Warhol would do a whole series of endangered species. Incidentally, a Texas painter, Robert Rauschenberg's the one who did the first Earth Day poster. Um, it's a rich history. But what happens is 73 is the end. What happens in 73? Why would all of this fervent energy, environmentalism, boom? A few things happen. One is called the Arab oil embargo. People got angry of high gasoline and inflation, and they boycotted the Arab countries to the United States. Um, what made Nixon got turned on by conservatives in his own party for being too green, too in bed with the left. There was also suddenly people realized NEPA and EPA, what it really meant if you were in the extraction business or the chemical business. It meant federal regulation, federal regulation, federal regulation. Um, but something else happened. In 1972, a man named Lewis Powell became Supreme Court Justice, a Republican. In 1971, Powell writes a famous memo to the Chambers of Commerce telling them we've got to stop Rachel Carsonism, meaning we've got to stop the federal regulations or capitalism will die. And they create the business roundtable. It's the beginning of corporations opening offices in Washington, D.C. to do lobbying. It's the beginning of the Heritage Foundation, the American Enterprise Institute, Cato, Pick your, your conservative action group and you'll see that they're being born out of the Powell memo as a rejection of environmentalism. Because things like race and gender can be debated, but environmentalism was busting companies at their bottom line. William O. Douglas was arguing in the Supreme Court that trees and rocks have standing in court. This went, was going far, and they, you naturally had the conservative counterswing. And Powell says it'll take decades. 
but we've got to shut down the universities from public speaking forums. We're going to have to create our own media, which is the Fox News phenomenon of today. We're going to have to create our own think tanks and spe conservative speaking bureaus. The left, Ralph Nader and these types have had such a run that it may take us 10, 15, 20 years, but we will win if we stand firm and unite around business principles and say no to these EPA hyper-regulated, meaning, and this is instantly where the Coors people and the Koch brothers come from. All of this is a rejection against the Rachel Carson revolution in the 60s. I end my book with all of these characters I carry throughout are gone. Lady Bird's long gone, Lyndon gone, Nixon gone, only like Ralph Nader's around. Um, and you know that, that whole generation is past, but we've been living on that revolution in the environmental world now. And the question is, three progressive eras, are we on the cusp of a fourth, a climate change revolution? And you're starting to see it take hold in the universities. It's young people right now that are putting climate on the top of the political agenda. Thank you. Thank you, guys. You could hear OK, right? Yes. Good. I have a little bit of an allergy going on. Everybody's glued. That's why they're not making any noise. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Rick. Uh, your book is so full of characters and stories. It's amazing. You guys will love it. My favorite. First, we'll talk about your book, and then we'll touch the election. My favorite chapter in your book is the one called Rachel Carson's Alarm. As I said, she's the first to make the existential case that humanity was capable of destroying the natural order, but she was also hopeful. If Rachel Carson were here with us tonight to talk about the climate crisis, what question would you ask her? How might she add to your remarks? Well, you know, one thing she never lost was her love of the oceans. And she was very worried that we were just dumping hazardous materials into the sea. And when you see these photographs of these garbage patches in the Indian Ocean and how we're throwing all of our industrial debris and treating our oceans like, uh, you know, sewage uh, areas, I would want to talk to her about the oceans. Um, because that's where her heart was. She was simply really an oceanographer, um, r brilliant writer. You know, if you can be like Charles Darwin in life and match science with beautiful writing, you really have something. And uh, I would want to ask her what we can do to protect our oceans today. Uh, as you mentioned, your books describe four waves of the environmental movement. The Two Roosevelts showed unique, the uniqueness of the American presidency with their audacity and initiative on conservation. The third and fourth, the 60s, and today's climate fight. How do these waves inspire you to reflect on the special character of the American presidency and its potential? Presidents, um, you know, Theodore Roosevelt, as I told you, is the only, he's our science president. He went, in, went to Harvard TR and majored in what today you would call wildlife biology. He wrote his first book a, um, as an undergrad called The Summer Birds of the Adirondacks. Theodore Roosevelt died while he just finished writing an essay for the American Museum of Natural History and the like of uh, essays on gopher tortoises, on pheasants. He took part in a rattlesnake ceremony in Arizona. He was a naturalist. Theodore Roosevelt was blind in one eye, but he could tilt his head and tell you what the bird was. He had learned his birds so well. He shares that with Rachel Carson. Uh, birding, bird watching, which might seem for some people to be a minor you know, hobby, has actually produced uh, most of our great um, naturalist thinkers are become um, real bird um, 
fans, to put it mildly. Um, and so, you know, the, when you have a leader like that, a leader like FDR, a leader like Lyndon Johnson on conservation, things happen. Um, but it has to come from somewhere. I, you know, some people, there's a thing, we're talking about oceans, there's a theory out there, and I can ask you guys this. Some people have what they call blue mind, that they need to be near waterway. They need to be on the ocean, they need to, need to be by a river, a lake, to feel complete. That you, know, you have to have a sense of blue mind. Kennedy had a kind of blue mind. He wasn't a camper, he wasn't a hiker, his butt was bad, but he found relief on the ocean and in Hyannisport and Cape Cod and in, in, in Palm Beach. Nixon didn't have it, but in that, I, guys, I, I did a program in New York at Federal Hall uh, where within, there was in the audience Ed, Nick, uh, Ed Cox, who's married to Tricia Nixon, and Ed said, my Nixon doesn't get credit for the environmental stuff he did. And I said, well, you, got, uh, you guys, I mean, Nixon family doesn't talk to any scholars despises professors in journalism, feels that Nixon's been picked on for Watergate, for, uh, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, and, the, um, and I said, well, I'm asking, tell me. I said, I only see Nixon in a suit with wingtips on a beach. Is he really connected in the natural world? And to Tricia Nixon's credit, she wrote me a very moving letter in great detail about Richard Nixon's love of nature. Now, a lot of this was about how he liked his dogs, how he'd feed nibbles at Camp David. I don't want to exaggerate what this was, but you know, she pointed out that he, picked, he chose sequoias and redwoods to give China in exchange for the panda bears. She pointed out that he, against all political odds, Nixon stopped a jet port being built in Florida that would have ruined the Everglades. Um, he saved places, he sided with the Sierra Club, Nixon, on fights like the um, Golden Gate National Recreation Area in California. Nixon did that in 72, and he did Gateway in New Jersey. He did like Cumberland Island, Georgia, siding with the Sierra Club. So Nixon was like a weather vane. Uh, he could blow, go any different way, but there may be a little bit of a side to him grow, living on the ocean in San Clemente, whale watching, um, that it made him a little bit attuned to, um, to the natural world, maybe a little more than I had realized it. I don't excuse Nixon for anything, though. I edited Nixon's tapes and the amount of anti-Semitism on them. I'm going to tell you, it's, it's ghastly. So I, I don't want to elevate him, but we're also dealing with the, the, been dealing with the nightmare of Donald Trump. And Trump never would have done a Cumberland Island National Seashore or worked with the Sierra Club on the, you know, San Francisco or worked to save endangered species. I found that Nixon does have had empathy for dogs. You might think that's a little thing, but he, he had some empathy for a living creature. I don't think Trump has that. I, I really hope you send your book to uh, President Biden. And if you do, what chapter would you mark for him to read? And what could he learn from this history in your book? You know, I think that the perhaps on the, I would most like him to read, I didn't talk about it tonight, but I love FDR. I think the Tennessee Valley Authority was great. I think the Grand Coulee Dam was necessary. We electrified our country. It was important stuff. But due to pork barrel politics in the 50s and 60s, we started damming rivers because politicians got pork. So you'd bring home 100 million to your district for an unnecessary dam. And now they're all over the West and they're killing Western rivers. They're killing the Salmon Run in Oregon and Washington. They're killing the Columbia River. They've killed the Colorado River. By the time the Colorado gets to, to Mexico, it's like a trickle of dirt. Um, and the Colorado was one of the most beautiful heirlooms and tears things that our country had, one of the world's great rivers. So I think there's a movement to start taking down some of these dams and trying to repair those ecosystems. And I, I, I would hope he would read how many smart people had joined the, recognized this as early as 60s and 70s, particularly as Senator, some of you 
may not know Frank Church of Idaho, who did so much in a state like Idaho to save rivers and wilderness, and remarkable, honest U.S. Senator Frank Church. If you don't know about him, he was a gem of a person. Uh, you've written so many books about the natural world, and your passion is just so evident, um, and you serve on so many environmental boards. How did you personally discover the national world? the natural world in your personal life? Well, my mother and father were teachers and we had a, a station wagon and a coachman trailer. And so I spent my summers camping all over America at KOAs, campgrounds. Um, you know, today they give young people passports for the parks, but we were doing basically that. We were check marking off how many national parks I could see and I, I, it had a real influence on me. But also, my real hero growing up was Dr. Doolittle. And I just loved animals and still do. I guess if I ever had a different vocation than being a history professor, it may have been a zoologist. I really enjoy interacting with creatures and watching them and reading about them. And I was reflecting on books that had a big influence on me or, or TV. And it was like a TV show flipper about dolphins or about a gorillas in the mist by Diane Fossey, and those things just touched me in a way. Um, there, E.O. Wilson, who died recently, and you've had here in your uh, progressive form, he used to say that there, some people are what he'd call biophilic. There are some people that need to have a other creature near them or plants, some of you might garden, that it, it, it creates a sort of spiritual happiness for you, and other people don't need it. But I, I was always very biophilic. I'm always very happy when I'm looking at, um, at other creatures and outdoor um, you know, types of settings, particularly with, with where wildlife is concerned. So it's so beautiful to be around the Houston area and go down to, and see when you have migratory birds here or getting to actually encounter whooping crane or, you know, uh, the, the, it's remarkable birding in the state of Texas. And I, I, I find joy in that. And my, so do my folks. Uh, let's turn to the election. I uh, knew it was coming. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> From, uh, I'd rather stay on all the beauty, but we need to, we've got some things to process. What, what strikes you interesting in these midterms? Well, I think the Democrats do better than I thought they were going to do. Um, I did think that you know we're, we're, uh, the Republicans were going to win Congress, and it looks like they probably will. Um, I thought the Senate would be close, but the amount of Democratic wins in state legislatures and governorships um, makes me realize that it's a it's it's not a, it, at best it was a red trickle, not a red wave. And it might even have been known in history as the blue firewall, like no to Trumpism, no to the reversal of Roe v. Wade, no to climate denying. Um, I can't help but notice that the southern states, the states that have been part of the Confederacy, are part of the Republican Party, and it's very hard to flip them. We'll see what happens in Georgia, whether, whether uh, um, Warnock, who's obviously more qualified than Herschel Walker, uh, whether, whether he can win or not. Um, I thought uh, Florida impressed me in the sense that Governor DeSantis seems to have, have, have garnered some steam to perhaps dethrone Trump. I was amazed that Ohio, um, you know, went with, um, I thought Tim Ryan was a very strong Democratic candidate, but their J.D. Um, Vance um, won to my chagrin. Um, Michigan is, I think, is a blue state now. I wouldn't call it um, purple. I mean, I think Michigan's blue and I think Florida's red. I think Ohio's red and Pennsylvania's blue. Um, and now, like all of you, we're waiting to see what happens in Nevada and Arizona and to see how important uh, Georgia in the end is for control over the Senate and also to see what Trump's move is. I mean, um, whether he decides tomorrow or next week or the, to run, announce, to avoid legal jeopardy and to try to regain some sort of momentum for himself. Uh, but this DeSantis-Trump 
feud is starting to really um, boil up. And, um, and it's, I have no idea how that in the Republican world is going to play out. In the Democratic world, it looks like Biden, who may not have been able to run, if, it, if the right won a won a, a substantial election, I think Biden may have, there would have been some pressure that you're too old or you're, you're not a, as strong as you should be, you need to step down. But I think now Biden will be the Democratic nominee and uh, run against DeSantis or Trump, um, depending on how that plays out. Um, I think the youth turnout is also noteworthy. Jen Zen, what do you, what do you make yeah, of that? Yeah, the youth turnout, climate is the big issue on youth. And for women, the you know um, abortion, uh, those are motivators for people in their twenties, first-time voters. Uh, that speaks what big for the Democratic Party. Um, I think the Republicans probably have had the advantage on what I would call COVID fatigue. Um, people, some people feel that the federal government or or maybe overreacted to the COVID and. So it gives DeSantis an advantage on that. Um, and, you know, the economy is, is hard to do what Biden did. I mean, Obama lost uh, 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 terribly in his midterm. And, and, you know, it's very hard in a midterm for Biden to have held the line kind of like he did is uh, probably the headline out of all of this. But alas, we could very easily, could be Republican Congress, Republican Senate, Trump running for president, and they start going after to try to impeach Biden and go after his son. Um, that's just as likely a scenario as anything else. Uh, I was struck too at the how little Republicans gained in the midterms, and I remember something Bill Clinton said about elections. They're more about tomorrow than they are today's pain. And I'm wondering if the, if the analysts are missing an underlying current Americans are feeling more confident and better tomorrow after Biden's big national invest investments, the receding pandemic, resilient job market, despite inflation. Well, you know, the stock market went way up a thousand points for, uh, but you know, the market goes up, it goes down, and it fluctuates. I do think we probably don't have this ways to analyze what the Pelosi um, invasion of the home space was. I thought that the Republicans were on a better track. And when Pelosi hit, the thought that leading Republicans were mocking somebody that's in the hospital with a fractured skull due to a would-be assassin into their house, that, that re-woke up people that forgot about January 6th or thought that the January 6th commission may have been slanted towards the media and the Democrats. That Pelosi thing is, like, I don't want an America like that, where somebody, much as I may not like Nance Speaker of the House Pelosi, I don't want somebody breaking in the house and, and fracturing somebody's skull, and I don't like people that find that funny. And uh, that may have been enough vote switch there. That plays into what Biden's democracy issue, you know, where this is to save the soul of American democracy. Um, you know, it started getting a little weak. Biden used it like five times. It was losing its wallop. But when Pelosi, um, Paul Pelosi was attacked, it was like, whoa. It's one thing that not only was he attacked, but that people were going on television and mocking him while he's in a surgery. Um, it just seemed like um, that may have been a more of a turning point than maybe we, we you know, can ever quantitatively show. I have a history question on Texas for you. Uh, the governor and the Republican legislature look to me like they're trying to bring back the Confederacy. Texas is now clearly a one-party rule, looking more like the Jim Crow South. But now abortion, vigilantes, voter suppression, book banning. In your, in your studies of the old South and other places, what citizen movements have you seen that drew us back to democracy? Um, back to democracy. Um, well, you know, there are always these moments of demagoguery and um, race politics. It's just part of American life. I mean, you think about how strong Huey Long and Father Coughlin and the and um, 
you know, these types were during FDR, calling him, you know, Rosenstein, and uh, he was, uh, you know, all of the Jewish tropes against FDR, when, as you know from Ken Burns' documentary, FDR didn't do enough. Um, uh, uh, but uh, nevertheless, um, you, know, uh, you know, so we, these things have been fought, fought before, but what's going on in Texas is uh, states' rights, um, versus federal government. It gets back to Texans feeling that we can do what we want in Texas and the federal government's not going to tell us what to do. And the problem, what I'm writing about, how do you have like clean air law in Massachusetts if, you know, Maine is going to have industrial pollution? How do you save bird life in, if Massachusetts Audubon saving birds only when they fly to the south, they get shot up? Uh, water and air by nature aren't owned by a state. They usually are, are interstates, and, and, uh, and yet in Texas, they would prefer to get the federal government out of here. They would, you know, prefer, and I was down at Zaya National Park in Utah in Cedar City, and in Utah, it's the same thing. They want, uh, the hard right would like to shut every national park down because it's bringing the feds to their backyard so this federal state versus states rights been going on forever, and oftentimes race and power and money are you know the the crux of it all. A couple of personal questions, if you don't mind. When and how did you discover your talents for research, insight, writing, communication? How did you discover yourself? When my um, my, as I mentioned, my parents were educators, and so my mom, uh, I read a lot, and I liked history a lot, and I think visiting these, when I, I mentioned parks, but you know, we would go to Independence, Missouri, and walk the streets of Harry Truman, or we'd go to Gettysburg Battlefield, or we'd go to the Battle of New Orleans site of Andrew Jackson, and you know, we would go in and see these things, so it sort of seeped in. Um, I don't ever think that I'm working, like here tonight, I'm not working. When I was working on this book, I don't feel, and yet I get thrown that, well, boy, you work hard, you work a lot, and I never, when you love what you're doing, it doesn't feel like that work. There are times it can be work-like, but, um, but by and large, most of my days, I don't uh, feel with work, but it is a little odd to be a historian because you live in the past. So even the 60s and 70s aren't that long ago, but all during COVID, I'm writing this book. I'm re I, my mind's like, what was Cleveland like in 1965? Not what Cleveland is like in 2022. And uh, that does create a kind of, so my, the people I want to meet are all people that are long gone. Uh, because like, I wish I could talk to this person or that person. And, uh, and um, you know, but um, it, so it's a little bit of weird profession being a historian. They late, Professor Stephen Ambrose said, being a historian is about reading other people's mail. And I feel that a lot. And now with the, with the iPhone and erasers, and I just wonder what it's, it, I think the fun of, I mean, the fun of writing about Rutherford B. Hayes' presidency is seeing his handwritten diaries. And today now people are just blanking, you know, destroy. There is no written tangible. So some of the fun has gone out of that. I must say, I've always liked music. And when I write, I always have music playing if possible. Um, somehow, for me, my mind works through music a lot. And my last question, and since Dean Koenig, I think, nearly brought the whole humanities department from Rice here. Where are they? Where are, where was Rice support here? There you go. Hey, hey. thank you guys for coming. So My I, dean is here, I think, yes? Yeah. Thank you, guys. So I have a question for the humanities department, for you, Professor Brinkley. What is the future of history? What should history scholars be considering that they're not now? Well, we're tackling a lot of it right now. I mean, on one level, I think the increase of um, women's studies, you know, gender studies, LGBTQ, indigenous people, 
more global perspective of history, less parochialism. I think that's all happening. Uh, it's long overdue. And so, uh, you know, I think that's what part, what's sort of exciting about this time in history. Um, I think fields that I'm, I'm allergic to are, are like the history of technology. Um, and and what's, since the computer and since Silicon Valley and all of how, you know, I just, like if I'm writing on Bill Clinton, I, my mind's like 1992, there's nobody, when he's running Bill Clinton, there's no emails. Mm. And by 2000, it's like a billion emails going around the world, uh, you know, daily. That's, you know, how, how, do you ca how do you even write about that? I saw a pro history professor sent me a galley of their book on the history of the fax machine. And it seems so distant and long ago when everything was such a big thing, fax. And, uh, and then also on an upbeat, well, I think the history of medicine is really interesting. I mean, when you read about how primitive things were in, with uh, medical attention, I just happened to be reading for a certain reason a book about the assassination of William McKinley and see, hearing what these doctors were doing to President McKinley's body. You know, it's so horrific from what we know today. And I just think about 100 years from now, look how people will look at how ignorant we are about, the, uh, about human, um, you know, or about our health and cancer. And uh, so that field of, science, uh, of medical miracles that keeps going in me medical history, um, you know, I think it's really interesting um, field because since the 1950s, DNA and the advent of it, it's very game changing. I mean. I could pretend like the big events of 54 are, are you know, Brown versus Topeka Board of Education, but it might be, you know, Crick and the gang's discovery of DNA. And the long sweep may have been the revolution, but, you know, it didn't get the press uh, or we don't talk about it as much. But the whole idea of DNA has changed everything and, um, and is going to continue to. Um. Douglas Brinkley, thank you for a beautiful evening. Thank you, guys. We're giving you a clock because we want to give you a good send-off for your book tour. So when you, this will remind you on your tour, you can think that this is my time. <laughs> Isn't Rand, what Randall does is amazing for all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well done. Thank you, guys. Thanks again for joining us. Please consider a donation and get your copy of Silent Spring Revolution at the link. Until next time, take good care.